again, I want to um, apologize to all of you for coming up here and being sick. Uh, that was not in the original program uh, or design. Uh, I want to again thank the Haven Center and the graduate students for uh, bringing me up here for this exchange. I just want to dive in. I'm feeling a little bit better than I did uh, yesterday. And so the mind, I think, will be a little bit sharper than it was yesterday, hopefully. Uh, but my body is feeling actually worse than it felt yesterday. Um, uh, so I may have to like walk and like move around so my back doesn't get stiff. So uh, just note that. Um, but to just dive into it, um, I want us to all remember this date, February 22nd, as a critical date per this subject. Uh, why? Folks know that Standing Rock had, was giving an order to clear out uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Central Time. And they started burning, uh, ceremony of burning, from what I was watching a little bit earlier, some parts of the camps. And folks, you know, there are several different camps uh, there, not just one. Um, and they're, they're starting to clear out, and it looks like there's going to be some level of um, planned or symbolic uh, resistance. Um, but for the most part, there's going to be a clearing of uh, the camp. Now this could either be a critical defeat for us, or it could be a learning lesson for us. And that really, I think, depends on us and how we internalize and analyze what's happened over the last past year with that struggle and what we need to know kind of going in uh, for the future. Now, one thing, um, uh, I touched on this yesterday, but I'm going to just dive into it uh, a bit. And people can agree or disagree. That's, that's why we have these kind of discussions. And we'll, we'll have a lively and plenty of time for debate and discussion early on, I mean later on. But uh, I cite this as an example, not as an isolated uh, incident, that a lot of the strategy uh, was situated around Standing Rock, around Obama and elements of the Democratic Party making certain decisions favorable to ending the pipeline, similar to what happened with the, the first phase of Keystone. And that, I think, was very problematic and very problematic to begin with. I don't think that we fully uh, assimilated all the lessons of what happened with uh, the Keystone piece um, in that it, there was a temporary halt, but it really led to Obama's uh, all of the above strategy, which was not a victory for our side, but it demobilized some aspects of our side. Right? It demobilized some aspects of our side. And, you know, as much as I love uh, IEN and uh, Tom and all those folks, um, I did not think what happened when the, when the veterans showed up in December was a victory. I thought it was a punt. And what I'm specifically referring to is when Obama uh, issued that, that small little uh, notice that they were going to halt and do some more investigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it got raved and passed on as it was a major victory. Um, and I'm not downplaying it as a victory, but I, it's not the ultimate victory. It's not the final victory. It didn't stop you know, what needed to be stopped. Uh, and I also want to put this day in, in context to just the political theatrics of kind of divide and conquer. Because there's another thing which to me was also very uh, symbolic that happened today. So after uh, a whole what year and some change of uh, the Trump campaign and now administration uh, playing up anti-Semitism in some of the most horrid ways 
in the most coded ways. Uh, they tried to do a repivotive the last two or three days, right, uh, around what has happened uh, with the desecration of uh, the Jewish cemetery in St. Louis. Now you put how they're playing this in context to everything else that they've been trying to drum up. It's like, why the 360? And then uh, for me, I think, you know, it, it draws the question around the value of uh, life. And what do I mean by that to try to connect it to? So one of the arguments that has been raised consistently around Standing Rock is that that is sacred ground, sacred territory. And that, uh, you know, their ancestors are buried there, which is well known and a well-established fact, actually. But the Army Corps of Engineers, the oil companies, the government in North, Carolina, uh, North uh, Dakota, and now, obviously, clearly, you know, the Trump administration has no regard for their traditions, for their life, for the desecration of their ancestors. So why play this pivot? Why do one against the other? It's a clear indication that some of us are more important than others of us. Some of us are worth being in allied with or worth neutralizing than others of us. And that is part of a deliberate strategy, an old white supremacy divide and conquer strategy. It's not without uh, intent, it's not without uh, forethought and planning. Uh, and I, this is one of the things that I want to, to warn. I think, for me, I'm, I'm very tired of hearing that Trump is like uh, stupid and that he's just spontaneous. Um, and that he doesn't kind of know what he's doing. I think we're totally sh selling uh, him short, and we're acting as if uh, some measure of intelligence might save us from the terror that he might unleash upon us. When I think, in fact, he's a very calculated man, and actually a very intelligent man. Uh, and he knows how to, you know, blow dog whistles, I mean, well. And he has a sense of history and strategy uh, very well. And it's been interesting, you know, to see how he is, um, he and his team, and I do believe that there is a team. It's not just him. Uh, it may not be a broad team, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a broad or a deep team. Uh, uh, at this point, anyway. But I think him and his team have been very deliberate from day one. And to me, it goes back to uh, how he announced his uh, presidential run this time. And remember I say this time, because he's ran for president before. I don't know if people know that. This wasn't his first go around running for president. Um, they kind of downplay that in the media, but I think he learned. And he took a page in his announcement from Ronald Reagan in making his campaign announcement in 2015. And when he went to the border and he had that uh, uh, Make America Great thing, peace, he took a page from Reagan's 1979 campaign when he came down to Mississippi. This is Ronald Reagan. For those of you who remember, Ronald Reagan came down to Mississippi to the very county and city where Emmett Till was, was lynched and murdered and announced his presidential campaign right then and there. Now many people may in this audience may be too young to remember that or, or wasn't born when that happened. But that's what Ronald Reagan did. And he sent a clear message from day one, who he was speaking to, you know, uh, and what he planned to, to do. And that resonated and moved large sectors, particularly of the South, to his banner. Donald Trump took that same page and played it masterfully. Right, and that takes a certain amount of both historical acumen and strategic thinking to pull off. Because you don't just stumble upon going to the border, saying I'm going to force Mexico to, cre to create a wall, then come out with a Ronald Reagan slowly and make America great again, because it's not his. That's something he took from Reagan. And, and to know how that would resonate, right? 
and to know how much the old Gipper, as they call it, is still loved by a broad spectrum of the right and as a, as a uniting force across the right uh, in this country, in this generation. So he was very tactfully from the beginning trying to call all those who could be united under one banner uh, under him, but particularly aiming towards uh, um, some elements of the, the, the far right, which have been largely, or are largely marginalized within the Republican Party. They, they're on their fringes, they're always on their fringes, but have been largely been marginalized. So that was something that was deliberate, deliberate and, and, and intentional. So for us, I'm bringing these things up, because one of the, the critical things that we have to do, I think, is to clearly understand who our opponents are. We have to clearly understand who our opponents are. And then we have to do an even deeper dive in trying to figure out who the hell are we? And what do we stand for? What do we believe in? What are we willing to fight for? And that is a big challenge for the left right now. Right, despite many of our ideas, we aren't that clear. Would y'all, would, am I, would you agree? Right? We aren't that clear. And we're on the defensive more often than not. Which is not a good place to be when you don't have much money. <laughs> you don't have your own media. <coughs> right? You don't have many of your own uh, cultural or political institutions grounded in, in communities. So being on the defensive, in our case, is a terrible position to be. So how do we go on the offensive? That is one of the fundamental questions that I think, you know, we are trying to pose. And so, uh, myself and a small group of uh, comrades, uh, since the election, uh, and I just, just so folks are clear, I, I thought Donald Trump was going to win. I thought he was going to win. Um, uh, and had been trying to prepare, you know, anybody who would listen for that, you know, uh, reality. Um, you know, this the map just lined up too well for him. And, you know, once they basically, uh, you know, once the Democrats ensured that, that uh, Bernie had no choice, we had no chance, that it was pretty much a done deal that, that he was going to win. Uh, because, you know, and just looking at in the Mississippi context, she had been buying Mississippi politicians since 2008. And I mean literally buying them. And then she tried to come and do several events in, in Jackson or have representatives of her team come. And despite all the money that she was spending, she could barely fill a room. Barely fill a room. So from our vantage point, you know, we knew that she was in she was in trouble. And for some types of uh, of events, you know, all you got to do in in Jackson is say there's going to be some entertainment and some food, and you'll have a full house. You know, uh, you know, and it could be, you know, we could just come up with a good catchy thing for any one of you, and, and as long as those two things are there, <laughs> you know, you can get a decent size uh, crowd. Right, and especially if it's free. If the food is free, you'll have some people there. But she couldn't. She couldn't fill a room on several occasions, not just one. She couldn't fill a room. So we knew that 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 she was in trouble. Um, you know, but the 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 map just lined up too well for him. And then I think the deeper um, the deeper piece that I think uh, that was missed was the consolidation of uh, the Tea Party, particularly in the Deep South in the Midwest. And I think that's a piece, you know, that we are, uh, uh, we don't pay enough attention to. And what do I mean by that? So, there's so much focus on Trump, 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 Trump. There's not enough focus, in my opinion, on what is now happening in the 33 states that the Republicans completely control. They are one state short of being able to, you know, have a constitutional convention majority. And for those who don't know, if they have that 34, that means they can change fundamental aspects of the Constitution. 
which they have long held, some of their think tanks, let me put it this way, some of their think tanks have long held as a strategic aim and objective of them having. And they have a clear set of programs. They don't all necessarily agree, but they have plans upon plans about once we get to that point, we're gonna change this. Once we get to that point, we're gonna change this. Once we get to that point, we're gonna change this. We don't have anything corresponding to the same thing. Anything corresponding to even half of what they are, are thinking and doing. Now, some things that do work in our favor in terms of us figuring out who we are. Now, they are going to, the, the Republican side, they are going to have to go through some major transformation to become anything more than a minority, a consolidated minority. Like the way that they have constructed themselves, you know, with a deep rooted sinnedness and, you know, just old school white supremacy, you can dress it up in, you know, so many different ways. But they haven't broke with that. You know, even with several attempts at trying to break with that. Uh, attempts at trying to bring in different Asians, different groups of Asians. Attempts at trying to bring in different groups of Latinos. They still haven't fundamentally broken with that. Right? And so they are still largely constructed around a diminishing white population at least diminishing in terms of what the overall growth rate and projection of, of growth in this country is. So they, at this point, are still happy with being a minority. And I think they're becoming much more strategic in understanding that we can be a minority if we are able to rig the system in particular ways. So yesterday we talked about gerrymandering, right? And how that's set up to protect certain minorities, just given the way that the system and the Constitution is, is set up about proportionality and around how many people per district, et cetera, right? And that was all always set up uh, because, you know, the way this country was set up, there was always, there was a divide between the North and the South that was there from the, from the, from the jump. The North being more populous than the South and the South having a particular species of property that, that couldn't vote, that couldn't participate in the political process, right? But they wanted them counted, which is where the three-fourths of a human being comes from as part of the, the toll to give one side a particular advantage even though you were counting people who in no form or fashion could be represent, or who could represent themselves, right? So that is the basis of the system. It's always been skewed, it's always been off, and it's never been anything remotely democratic from Jump Street. Uh, and I say that because I don't, I think the left needs to give up any pretension around maintaining the sanctity of the Constitution. Which is, I think, sometimes a hard argument for us to really delve in. But from my vantage point, there's not much worth saving about the structure of this empire. There's really not much worth saving, right? Um, let's take the time, energy, to do something completely new. Now, it might have some elements of the old in it that may be somewhat inevitable, but we don't have to be beholden to the past in order to create something in the, in the new. And that doesn't mean that we take away, uh, that for us that means we abandon the argument around democracy. For me, I mean, I think it's the exact opposite, right? Upholding democracy is not the same thing as defending the Constitution. And that is sometimes how we get pigeonholed, at least I see that in, in Mississippi, we get pigeonholed. And I was like, no, I'm arguing for something far beyond the Constitution. Far beyond what you guys ever intended, you know, for people like me and my ancestors to, to ever, you know, participate in and be engaged in. And I'm arguing for something far beyond your legitimacy to be able to you know, enforce upon me or upon anybody else, which is, which is another critical piece. So I think we need to get rid of that, that kind of hold and argue for something new. I think we really need to dig deep into the radical imagination. I don't think we do enough of that. I don't think the left does enough visioning. And we used to be the side that did most of the visioning. <laughs> you know, most of your great science fiction came from people who was on our side of the equation, not the other side of the equation. 
right? Um, so I want you to think about that, what that means, you know, because that speaks to human aspiration, what we could be, right? What we could be, what we could do, what we could aspire to. And I think that's a space that we need to reclaim. And I think we need to abandon these arguments that, you know, people in the United States are, are too conservative. You know, we can't talk to people because they're too conservative. I don't think that's true. I think, you know, despite what many of us may criticize around Bernie Sanders campaign, I think the last 10 years with Occupy, with the Emerging for Movement for Black Lives, I think we're finding that there's, there are far more people out there wanting something profoundly different than we give credit to. Right? Profoundly different than we give credit to. I think the issue is we don't, we haven't created either the, the vehicles to reach those folks. Right? And that is one of the deep, I think, problems of the left. And when I mean vehicles, I'm not just, you know, I'm not, I, I belong to an organization which has many of the trappings of the old school Marxist Leninist tradition. So I understand that very much. But I'm not necessarily talking about those old school vehicles. I think we need to create new things and experiment with different types of mass organizations, right? I think some of the things that we are seeing, we've been seeing with, uh, you know, say Podemos, uh, or some early aspects of what was happening with, with Syriza, and some of those things, which, which you have political forces tied to social movements, you know, in a very organic and concrete way. I think we need to start heading in that direction. And hopefully you guys have talked some about what you guys were doing in Scotland a little bit here with this audience. Because uh, I think there was also some critical lessons there. At least I know some, some that we were studying. So I think we need to look in that direction. And one of the big challenges I think we have, again, looking at this date, again, and, and trying to remember it, you know, how can we start more concretely linking the struggle around Standing Rock and the protection of water? And then the, the deeper, larger question of indigenous sovereignty. How can we link that more concretely with the struggle for black liberation? How can we start concretely uh, connecting that with the struggle around you know, the emancipation of labor? And there's several campaigns which are kind of emerging or been around on the scene that are aiming in that direction. The fight for 15, probably the most famous, but not the only one. How do we link these things, right? That is one of the critical pieces I think we're gonna to have to figure out how to do in this next period. And we're gonna to have to figure out how to do that organically from the bottom up and not, you know, from the instruments of the Democratic Party. Okay, okay. Right. Though this is our challenge that I think that we have to we have to do. Now I I would be remiss in not saying one thing and then I'm gonna stop and open it up for question. So the I mentioned this ungovernable project, this ungovernable framework that a few of us have put out. We've tried to simplify the aspects of how to wage resistance in this new era, or the present era, into a combination of what we call build and fight, or fight and build, right? And that is we have to, in our view, we have to spend as much time building alternative institutions, autonomous, grassroots, self-managed, self-directed institutions in our communities. We have to spend as much time as we do that as we, we spend fighting against all the reactionary stuff that's gonna come down. And for us, we've been telling folks, particularly like in the case of Mississippi, you know, last year in 2016, we spent a lot of time and energy, this is Cooperation Jackson in particular, we spent a lot of time and energy fighting a set of reactionary policies that came down from the state legislature aimed at just breaking the, so the, the, the sovereignty of Jackson to, to the extent that it exists, to, to just breaking it up. Now we temporarily defeated four of the five most egregious policies, but it came at a cost. It came at a cost that some of our co-ops didn't develop in the way that we had intentionally planned on them developing you from the strategic plan coming in from 2015 into 2016. And then turn around 2017, they're right back with the same four that we defeated, but with even greater force and greater clarity this time around, right? So we had to have a hard conversation 
you know, our, our coordinating committee. We had to have a hard conversation about we can't fight every single thing. And some things we're just gonna have to get our ass kicked on for now. Because it's more important in our evaluation to build up some critical resources for the long term fight in Mississippi. Right? And they can outspend us, they get all the media access and everything, you know, and there's only so much that our limited forces can do. So you know, some things just like biting our tongue, we see it passing in, in the house and we know it's going to have a negative impact. But we're starting to think about how do we counter that? And how does us building, you know, uh, our land trust counter the gentrification that's coming? Right, and how do we educate the community about what's, what's coming down? Even though we couldn't stop, we're not going to be able to stop this capital complex bill, which we call it uh, the downtown annexation bill. We're not going to be able to stop that this time around. But, you know, we can do a deeper thing of organizing the community in a different way to fight in a more long-term and strategic way, right? So it's kind of making some of these trade-offs, I think, in the short term that I think all of us are going to need to think through. And so we've divided this up into build and fight. And one of the, some of the things that we've been saying that our forces need to basically do you know, is there's a, there's a set of things in terms of strengthening our, our existing organization and building some new institutions around like co-ops, you know, timeshares, mutual aid network, sanctuary cities. We got to get real about those things, right? The times demand it, and I think we have to come to a deeper understanding of what some of those things mean. And for us, we're being very clear with folks that, particularly around the sanctuary or freedom city thing, we're asking people, we want people to be clear about that, we're asking people to break the law. And we want everybody to be clear about what that means. Because that's going to become a more pressing reality the further this particular administration and this regime goes down the road. We're going to have to make concrete choices to do that. Because they're going to come up with, you know, with the supermajority that they have, you know, in the legislature, plus the Trump administration. They will have the Supreme Court shortly. You know, it's just a reinforcing, at least for a couple of years, assuming that the democratic process is going to continue. <laughs> uh, and that's an assumption, which I don't particularly hold, but that's an assumption. So let's say we all make that assumption that it will hold. They are still locking some things in for quite a long time, at least the Supreme Court which is becoming more and more critical, as we see you know, with uh, the, them allowing uh, not only corporate personhood, but now corporate, these corporations can spend an unlimited amount of money in, in electoral politics, right? We already see the, the consequence of that, I think, in terms of how the Congress is now presently constructed. So these are some things that we're gonna have to really, I think, dive in and, and, and deal with. Then the other piece is we're going to have to continue to fight. We can't give that up. But I think the, the being more strategic about when and where we fight, I think is going to be critical. And that may come as like a hard pill to swallow, but the way I phrased it, you know, at least in, in uh, some of the, the, the conversation we've been having, you know, in, in our internal uh, uh, operations and cooperation, Jackson. So we've been trying to put it to a younger audience. Most of our membership, for those who want to most of our membership is very young in Cooperation Jackson. And so they want to go fight everything. They want to go to Standing Rock. You know, they want to go back up to Ferguson. They want to go here. They want to go there. And to a certain extent, we always support that. You know, like go check it out, get some experience. You know, but there's a certain level of saying, okay, look, let's say, you know, Trump calls for you know, this was a couple of weeks ago, so it's now it's happening. Let's say that Trump calls for the, 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 the total destruction of the camps at Standing Rock. And then the next day, he calls for putting the, the, the federal troops uh, into Chicago like he was threatening. And then the next day, he deputizes more people down on the Texas, Arizona, New Mexico border, you know, to, to lock that up and to hunt down more people. Y'all gonna go want to fight in every single one of them, and do we have the capacity to go all those different places? No, we don't. No, we don't. 
And the thing is trying to get them to understand, and they're being, being in Mississippi, they're very brazen about the change and what it means. And it has been a significant change. So one of the things that we are saying is that the second reconstruction, if you understand that framework, you agree with that framework, the second reconstruction, which basically started 54, 55, um, all of that, those special arrangements that got created, that they are fundamentally gone. And the last one that you hear, you know, at least on the talk show radios, and to a certain extent we've been hearing in the legislature in Mississippi, is they're very gleefully, you know, happy that the special relationship that the black community had, and wasn't the only one, but the black community in the South had with the federal government, <laughs> meaning that there were certain agreements that had got set primarily in the 1960s, or 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, that the federal government would be a line of defense against the terror of the southern states. That has been an agreement very implicitly. Now, it's, not, it's not like the federal government comes running to our aid. Don't get that impression. It never happened like that. But there's been an acknowledgement, at least since the early 1950s, that the black community in the South needed some special protection against the southern states, right? And that, there were a number of different things in terms of, you know, how HUD money might be given out, for example. And instead of going to the states, it went to certain cities, particularly black majority cities. They're straight up saying, that day is over. There's nobody coming to protect you anymore. And that is now a political truth, right? All of those arrangements are now basically gone. And I don't think that's fully set in for everybody yet, what that means, right? And, and what they might do as a result. I, don't, I think they're still trying to figure out what they're gonna do. But one thing that's been very interesting, they've, they've, they've put forth all these Blue Lives Matter bill kind of things, right? And Louisiana, I think, passed the first. And the Blue Lives Matter thing is, you know, like if you argue with a cop, you can get a felony, right? Uh, or if they say that you argue with them or looked at them wrong, then you can get a felony. Just, without, you know, just breathe on them the wrong way, right? And you, you go into jail. But the one that they put up to me that was the most revealing. In Mississippi, there's a, they introduced two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, to reintroduce vacancy laws. And for those of you who don't know what the vagrancy law was, that was a way after slavery was formally ended to re-enslave black folks in the South that lasted roughly until the 1940s, vagrancy laws throughout the South. Which is to say that, you know, if, if you were just walking downtown, you know, in a city, and the police decided to pick you up, they can just charge you for being a vagrant and put you in prison and, and, and force you to, to, to execute prison labor. Right? And you had to go through, you know, oftentimes a long legal process to clear your name and how many people had the resources to, to defend themselves? Not many. Right? Not many. So for them to bring that back clearly speaks to where they're trying to go, or at least a section of them, or where they're trying to go. So, you know, we need to be clear on what some of them are, are thinking about, and it's the time for us to get clear on Again, who we are, where we're going, what we want to see. And that's going to take a lot more dialogue and debate and discussion with each other than I think we've allowed the time for, or taking ourselves seriously enough to engage in. But we got to do it now, and we got to do it quickly. So I'm going to open it up for questions. So you may have talked about this some yesterday, and I'm sorry I wasn't here, but can you talk about the relationship between the work of building cooperatives as independent structures and working to gain control in a municipality like Jackson in the political system, and how those two relate to each other in terms of a long-term strategy? Um, is there any other question? Because. I'm gonna deal with that, but yesterday I think there, I missed some questions. So maybe take a couple of them at the time. Yeah, uh, this is maybe hard and I don't know, but um, you 
something uh, the tactics and the strategy that you sketched out. Um, how would you relate that to the branding that's needed to get people to organize? To the last to part. The branding, branding. So the way I see it is that uh, we've been thrown to our back feet and we're now in reactionary mode. Um, what we have as resources are the the supposed safeguards of the Constitution. So one way to brand this is to say these things are not Constitution. Um, ACLU might uh, launch um, uh, <coughs> vanguard actions like they're doing in Milwaukee right now based on constitutional protections that they want to make sure are preserved. What you said is that we have to think forward and that the Constitution is not our best guarantee. So I've, I'm hoping that I've said enough that you might be able to square the branding versus the strategy and tactics. Okay, well, that's enough. <laughs> Those two. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, to deal with, with your piece, it's a longer conversation, but, you know, for us, really trying to do co-ops in the way that we're trying to do them is, is part of an acknowledgement that uh, black labor has been become largely disposable in this country. And we are trying to counter that through self-organization. Now how that's linked to the, the quest for political power, most concretely in our case, which may not be the case in other places, you know, uh, I, I live in a city which is 85% black. So the demographics already work very heavily in my favor, you know, for linking the question of, you know, do you want a job? To let's utilize our numbers to create the political force that reinforces us being able to create our own jobs. Right, so that, that's an easy bridge for us to make in, in our case and we can easily make an argument, and we do, you know, that, you know, the, the, a large part of the economy uh, in the Jackson metro area uh, is driven by state contracts, you know, uh, city contracts primarily, not just state contracts, but city contracts. And with a black majority, you should have the political will to be able to reorganize how the procurement and all those contracts are utilized so that it benefits the community and not necessarily as a drain or to you're supporting the bedroom communities, which are predominantly white. Uh, uh, you know, so let's flip that on its head. And that's an easy argument to make that resonates with, with most of the black community very easily. Now, putting that into practice is a little bit different than making the argument. So that's still an ongoing struggle, um, uh, you know, for us. And then we're also very clear, you know, for us that that's an argument, but we're also very clear that we are building a set of cooperatives which are dependent upon state funding, you know, our city funding. That we're trying to build a set of uh, cooperatives, first and foremost, to anchor cooperatives that reinforce each other and create a, 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 an ecosystem, a self-sustaining ecosystem, which is about improving the quality of life. And that's the longer term piece that we're trying to get folks to, to understand. Because there's some aspects of the, of the broader kind of global economy as it's presently set up that we are very intentional about trying to extract ourselves from and not get deeper involved with. So there's a, there's a deeper uh, of component of transformation in what we're trying to do with the, the cooperative building than just provide jobs, you know, which is a critical component. You've got to start there but trying to go deeper than just kind of provide jobs. Um, and that's gonna take time, you know, uh, to do. But for instance, we, you know, like, uh, um, one of the critical things that I didn't state yesterday, uh, you know, part of our strategy, uh, I think a core part of our strategy is starting with the notion of food, building the notion of food sovereignty in our community and building our network of cooperatives in and around that. And how do we create kind of our own, you know, metabolic system that supports that. So, 
you know, having a compost cooperative. Most people think that that's, you know, we've had even other folks like, y'all kind of, why, why are you doing it? You're crazy. But it's like, okay, we, the political objective is to make Jackson a zero waste city. And with that, you create a lot of labor, right? Or jobs, you know, you create a lot of jobs. Uh, it may not be the most ideal jobs, but you create jobs, right? And how do you translate that into replenishing the soil, right? Which is another critical need that we know the capitalism is destroying on a, on a rapid level. And that by many scientific estimates, we got what, 50, 60, 70 years at most of using this, the, the you saying this, Laura, how many? 40? 40 years of, speak, speak up so people can hear And then we're in deep shit, right? Um, so we are trying to think that far into the future, right? And and saying how do we do that? And and if we can stop part of that cycle now, and build both labor and a sustainable system, you know, of of employment that builds a political power, and that builds a systemic basis for us to to move. So it's it's. It would take too long to, to, to rekindle, but, and for us, we, we, we want folks to be clear. The, the one of the biggest, our biggest internal criticism is that, you know, black folks have never been in a position of determining their own economic future in this country. I'm not saying that. Most sometimes when people put that, uh, um, put that in some framework, they're usually talking about supporting some variant of black capitalism. That ain't what we're talking about at all. That's not what we're talking about in the slightest. But that still is a real political reality that we, we have to confront. And it's a, it's a great organizing tool for us in our community around, you know, do you want to control your own destiny? you want to keep working for these folks who don't pay you well and don't, you know? And part of that is, is you exercising, you know, what you have in abundance, which is political numbers, and using that as a point of leverage and point of power. And that's an easy message that, that resonates and gets across, right? So those, that's one level of link that I just want to talk to in reference to this. Now, in regards to your question, you know, this branding thing is tricky. It's very, very tricky. Um, let me say why from my uh, vantage point, why I think it's tricky. Uh, I'm assuming that given what Donald Trump has said, and thus far given his inclination to do, or at least try to do what he said he was going to do, there won't be that many cerebral liberties left pretty soon, as we understand them, right? So I, I can't base a strategy on assuming that certain things that exist now will exist six months from now or a year from now as it relates to the Constitution and how that those constitutional quote-unquote protections uh, are guaranteed and from my vantage point you know as a black person I've, I've I haven't seen them applied to me in a lot of ways anyway ever or to at least to my advantage, and often they apply to my disadvantage, right? Giving some more preference over you know their life, more value than my life. So there's nothing. I don't know if I turned it off. Or, uh, so there's nothing about that. There's nothing about that that um, I want to to bank on for too long. Uh, now I understand why a force like the ACLU uh, would want to do that <coughs> and feel they need to do that. And I would even support it, right? I, I, I'm one who believes that we need a diversity of tactics. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not one who says this is the only way that, that we're going to win this. I don't think we, we know that. Uh, and we're so disorganized and weak right now that to narrow ourselves down to just one set of things is probably suicidal, 
quite honestly. So, you know, my only criteria is to ask other folks in the struggle, if you, if whatever you do, just think about the broader social consequences of it beyond your own forces, your own limited forces. Right? I can't tell you what to do, but I just want you to think about the social and political ramifications. Because you may be, you know, some, some forces might be, you know, there's all this, this uh, debate that's going on now around, you know, some of the, the black bloc tactics and, and some of the, the anarchist anti fascist stuff and people want to suppress that and suppress that. And I'm like, no, I, I don't I don't support suppressing it. I support engaging comrades in a in a public conversation about what are the social implications of confronting some of these forces head on right now. And my thing is I don't think that that's wrong, actually. Right? But if, if that's not tied to a strategy of organizing masses of people to support it, you're just going to have the hammer of the state come down hard on you. Yeah. Right? So whatever, whatever we do has to have, a, in my opinion, whatever we do has to have a mass strategy tied, tied to it. Or at least a, an attempt at a mass strategy tied to it. Right? But, um, you know, we we've already so like in Jackson. You know, we've already seen just just uh, in January last three weeks. There's been five uh, hate hate crimes, whatever. You know, uh, they tried to burn down uh, 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 one of the leaders of Respect Our Black Dollars, uh, which is a, a, a one of like our sister organizations, uh, allied organization. Um, they tried to burn the, the, the leader of his house down. You know, they vandalized the, the leading kind of black radio station, you know, sprayed it all up, broke some windows, and there's been some other stuff. Um, now, six, seven months ago, those same forces wouldn't even have crossed the Pearl River. You know, the, the Pearl River divides Jackson proper from Rankin County, right? They wouldn't have even crossed over there. So it's a different political reality. And to think, to think that we're going to resolve that through dialogue, you know, I'm like, no, that's not, you know, that's, that's not what's going to, to have that. Do that. Does that mean we don't try to dialogue with forces? We, sh we should. And I think the question is, can we, if, is dialogue going to lead to isolating those forces? I would argue in the present terms, probably not. But it doesn't mean that you don't, you don't engage in it, but you don't rely upon it. That's the critical thing. I'm not relying upon some dialogue to save me from a clan attack. I have to organize my community in a totally different way to repel a clan attack. And that's not something I'm a brand. That's not something I'm going to be talking a whole a, a, a lot about publicly. But I think in many communities and throughout this country, we are getting to that point. And I think I want us to recognize that. It may not look the same in Madison as it looks in Mississippi. You know, they may not be the, the same targets, in, in, at least as the first order, uh, uh, in Wisconsin as it is in, in Mississippi. But, you know, as I was saying, you know, the, what I want most white folks to understand is that being white is not going to protect you from what they have coming. Right? I think that deal and that, that set of... Yeah, that's that's over, you know, and I think they're going back very, very intentionally to a 16th century social order, you know, uh, which there was some privilege for whiteness, but not much, you know, uh, you know, particularly for women or if you were Irish or, you know, if you were, you know, uh, Italian, good luck to you, you know, within that order. So um, when, you know, after the occupation and when it was of the Capitol here and when it was diverted into the recall and the Democratic Party took over and there was no strike and it was watered down, um, the next smaller thing that happened was the arrest for singing at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And my um, <coughs> button, which I never made, was you have constitutional rights until you use them. 
Okay. Also, um, I have no idea why, but the Washington Post put out uh, Top Secret America before Snowden, and you could put in your zip code, and you could see where all the FEMA and all the organizations were. All the fusion centers and stuff. All the yeah. fusion centers and, you know, and literally, you know, what three are like in the Capitol. You, you even can read if you just Google, because they're not hiding it yet, because nobody's looking at it, some of the minutes of some of the things, I and mean, maybe not the most top secret things. And I kept saying, look, the LRAD came from Homeland Security Fusion Cop Grant. Uh, where are these cops coming from who we've never seen before? You know, and this type of thing. But because these were first time and don't see a long history and we had a good life in Wisconsin, people didn't want to see it and they just called me too angry. And that's why I don't have friends. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, singing I don't want you being mister is not a lullaby. You know, and so I've just watched this happen. So what's happening is people are just concentrating on the small thing they did. <coughs> I guess my question is, is there a book, is there something to like open people's eyes that this is a fight? You know, like, it's, it's, we can't do just this or that and it's going to be okay. I mean, how do you tell a congregation who's named after somebody who died down south, supporting people, that raising money through Amazon is like really something, I mean, they kind of know they're conflicted about it, but they do it. Mm -hmm. And that all those things are connected. And do you go to younger people? Is that... A couple of questions I hear in there, so I'll try yeah. to get them, but it's taking more. There was one woman Question. with the flower. Thank you. So this this is amazing work you're doing with all your people, and, and just thank you for coming to share it with us here. Um, I'm going to ask an annoying question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not antagonistic at all. I completely am on board with everything you say, but I just kind of want to hear what you say about this. So, you mentioned that your organization comes out of a Marxist-Leninist framework in some way, shape, or form, right? Where, like, on that model, it's working people, period, right? Like, all working people are united in, in a way. Um, and it's very transversal, and there's a kind of strong international dimension Let, let me it. correct you. You know what I'm going to say? Okay, sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I just want you to be clear before you understand before you okay, explain that. So it, it's the applic it's for us it's been some applications of the Leninist style of organizing. Uh, but okay. we we are fundamentally an organization that has been struggling for the, the national sovereignty and independence of black people or what we call the new African nation. Okay. So it is it is not about the universal liberation of the working class as a first priority, okay. which makes it different than your standard Marxist-Leninist organization. Okay, so that actually helps. So I think then <laughs> there's less of um, there's less of a question here. Oh, okay. Um, but but my question is is it still holds? Because you made a big point just now about the need for for deep unity, right? In this moment of resistance. And my basic question is. Do you see any kind of tension between a model that says, for instance, we're going to make Jackson, Mississippi this incredible place with worker cooperatives, with timeshares, with food sovereignty, with black people having real rights in a way that is not true, say, anywhere else in this country? Do you see a tension between that, to put it in a mean way, just to kind of highlight the question that I'm trying to ask, a like, bubble model? of what you want to build, a good, a fantastic, a beautiful bubble, versus, like, basically, how does that jive with the deep unity that you, yourself, are saying is so essential, and, yeah, so, so how does that work? Is it that Jackson will be a source of inspiration, um, or do you see it kind of a totally different way? Have I, have I, you know, I, I, I no, 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 I got you. I think okay. I got you. Um, good question. Good question. So uh, the point about vision really resonated with me, um, and I know you haven't read my seven-part series on. I have read some of them. Unblocking the show. no, it's just coming out. Oh, well, I've read the book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but this is a different thing. Different because okay. what I'm doing is associating 
blockages in our movement, the chakras of the body, and saying, here's what we need to do with the vision. No, I ain't one. seen that yet. So, uh, <laughs> so that's coming out on blackjack.com this week. But, uh, but you, the point that struck me also was the you saying that uh, you and other folks felt like uh, Trump was going to win. And there were some of us in Missouri who felt the same way. Um, and then when it came down that uh, Clinton lost, there was a lot of uh, sadness by some of the white liberals and even some white radicals. Mm -hmm. And so there were a number of folks who had been organizing on the ground who were like, very upset because we had tried to say, this is what's happening, this is how we read it, and this is, you know, we're on the ground, we're organizing. And then when it did happen, there was a lot of anger from folks who were saying, well, why is it that our voices were not heard when we are part of this kind of movement? And it seemed like it came down to like, class and race. So uh, so when you talk about how we are going to internally build a deeper unity, uh, that was the lesson I think we learned from that, not to be beating people over the head that they didn't listen to that too, but it was the why. And if we're going to be moving forward, and you know, and, and you holler to the other folks of uh, the, the, the oppressor that all voices count, but in our movement, <coughs> all voices are not counted. Right. Then how are we going to rectify building some real uh, genuine unity? Right. So it kind of bounces off that question about the bubble. So let me stop there. So what was I saw your hand, and then it was hand there, right? Then, then, then it, okay. So that'll be the next three. Um. Let me start with yours. Um, we're not interested in building a bubble. You know, they can crush that real quick. Um, so uh, if, if we are building and supporting uh, other cities, you know, in building strong uh, movements, then it's kind of for not, you know, um, uh, you know, this notion of municipal socialism, you know, we, we push it, but we don't think it's something that in and of itself is going to save us, you know, given the strength of the state government and given the strength of the federal government and just the nature of, of how U.S. imperialism works. So we, we don't have no illusions that, you know, uh, you know, we're going to protect some, you know, we're going to create some paradise and then shield it off from <laughs> the rest of the world. That, that ain't going to happen, you know, so... Um, that's not what we're interested in. I mean, I think our thing is, look, this is this is where we live. This is where we there's some conditions that are favorable, and you know we're gonna we're gonna try to move it as, as deep and as hard as we can, and uh, you know hopefully it can be used as as a reserve that that you know will inspire, provide some resources down the road for other places to to use as a launching pad to to organize. You know, so that's the the aim and, and objective. You know that that we're uh, uh, you know hoping for, and like why we come to a place like Madison or St. Louis, we, we we don't have no illusion that we're going to do this by ourselves. You know, like you know this is too much, this is too much of a beast and too complicated a, a you know a dragon to, to slay. You know, uh, by ourselves. So we're just like, look, we we think we found some things that work. Um, we think we found a few things that that are worth paying some attention to. And we want to talk about it and talk about it in this honesty of, you know, what the successes have been and then what the challenges. We, we still got a lot of challenges, you know, challenges that all y'all face. They ain't went nowhere, you know, motivating our own people. And, and all, that, ain't, that ain't, you know, uh, necessarily went anywhere. And they're, they're bridging with what, what uh, Jamala was saying is taking it even deeper. We were doing internal PE about what to do when, when Trump won. We started doing that in September. With the night, and we did a, a, a broadcast that night, you know, like an election night broadcast. It was too damn long, but, you know, it was like six, seven hours that, that we were on and had people from, uh, you know, the comrades from all over the country and a few folks internationally were on. And I remember after it was over, and it was like one o'clock in the morning, despite all of that, people were still sad. Despite all the prep, some of our own members were still sad <coughs> that Hillary lost. And it wasn't they were Hillary supporters, it was just like, I don't believe what just happened. You know, like, even though we did the analysis, it was still like, I don't, you know, I'm just like, okay, you know, let's, it's on now, let's go, you know, let, you know, but it was still, 
Even on our own forces, there's a lot of moping around. I don't know what to do. Like, we got a plan, y'all don't. Just, we got a plan. <laughs> Let's go with the plan. You know, wake up tomorrow. You know, we'll. But it took two or three weeks, you know, I think for folks to really kind of get out of the fog. And I would say, even for our own forces, despite all the criticism um, that people had about the Women's March, you know, amongst forces that I'm close to, there was a whole bunch of criticism. I was literally, you know, <coughs> hoping that that was going to be a major success. Because I thought that it would be a psychological boost to our, our side mm -hmm. of the equation, right? That the, that the turnout would be substantive. And I was so happy that it was, right? Despite all the other criticism people might have and how much money the Democrats put it, whatever. I think it was a good psychological boost. And I think we needed that on, on, a, on a deep level, right? And I think this, the shock is still there. And why I was saying and noting, like, to, this mark today is a critical turning point. Because just two months ago, you know, Standing Rock was being celebrated and touted as a major victory for our side. And now there's been basically a, a, a quick reversal. And what is going to be the psychological state of our side of the equation? And that is something, you know, trying to work on a deep, democratic process, I'm learning to take psychology a little bit more seriously, right? What people's actual mental state is, like what, in, and where their spirits are for the fight, and, and how much, you know, how important that is, you know, because I, um, part of it just my personality, but I'm, I'm one of them kind of people, you just tell me what I need to do. And y'all don't need much motivation. Like, as long as it makes sense, like, okay, this is going to get me here, like, I'll do it. And, and just to be self-motivated. But that don't work for everybody. Right? Having the clear plans and the clear strategy, you know, that don't, that don't work for everybody. And I think we, we got to pay a lot of attention to, you know, uh, how, we, how we engage, you know, the people in the mass struggle. Right, and trying to uplift people's spirits and, and get them to see the possibilities even when times are tough or when times are rough. And it makes me, you know, uh, so like the older I get, I have, uh, uh, this may sound weird, but the older I get, the more appreciation for my people's history and culture I have about, you know, what, what, you know, what they, what my ancestors did to survive this bullshit, you know, uh, you know, that you just don't, you know, sometimes you take for granted, at least I know, you know, uh, I did, you know, in terms of growing up in a, uh, in a household that was very critical of like the black church and, you know, some aspects of our tradition, which are worth criticizing, don't, don't get me wrong. But I think sometimes we threw the baby out with the bathwater and, and missed that aspect of how, how, you know, that was keeping people connected and, you know, grounded and willing and ready to fight and how important that is, right? Uh, and I'm seeing that more and more and more like, okay, we need, you know, that's a vital piece that you can't overlook and overstretch. Yeah. Just hit on a point that, you know, is really significant. Uh, we often forget that shadow slavery ended just 152 years ago. My grandfather was a slave. My great-grandfather. My grandfather was enslaved in 1891 on the chain gangs. Had to work his way one month at a time for almost nine months across Texas. From one county line straight to. So, and my point with that and you just hit something that's very significant, is that it's been, it is a horrible battle, you know, 150 years of transatlantic slave trade, um, but in 450 years, thanks to people largely like people from Madison, right? Liberal white folks, radical white folks, We've come from 4 million to 50 million in 152 years. And that is why, and that also is what you're talking about, 
is that as horrible as this battle has went from 4 million to 50 million, I think the statistics, you know, like 40 something, and we know that, you know, 15, 20 percent of our people are high. Right. You know, so add, add, add that five or six more million on there. From 4 million at the Emancipation Proclamation, Juneteenth, at that time, to 50 million, that could not have happened unless your ancestors, and I'm speaking to white folks, had not did something that our current generation of white radicals and revolutionaries and uh, progressives has forgot. It was supporting the struggle of black folks. And it it's not your struggle in that way. It is our struggle. And I think that what I'm largely hearing is that a big part of your role is to resource the leadership that exists. We have a leadership in the black community. We have a life and death analysis. <laughs> we have it. And what we need is resourcing. And then the last part, on branding, um, which is 100%. Who controls the dominant narrative? Right? White folks. And black folks will reject branding because we have been under terror for that whole 600 years. You know, so I just wanted to, that, that's what I thought when you said branding. I was like, branding what, how, you know? Thank you. And, but, and let's go deeper on that point because you may be something I wanted to, to recall. I don't think enough attention is being made of uh, the actions that happened on the uh, 20th, some of the black bloc actions, uh, how they are systematically hunting down folks who participated or, or are alleged to have participated in some of those actions and, and charging them with serious felonies. I think the count right now is up to almost 160 people uh, have been, been uh, uh, tracked down and charged with different felonies from what happened in D.C. with that black block action. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the, the, the piece that is, I think, particularly interesting about it, that, that there's a couple of articles that I've read, and I've been following it very closely, is, you know, how they're using different kind of, uh, uh, you know, people wear the, the mask and stuff like that, but they're, they're using all kind of, you know, these new computer matrices. Facial recognition. Beyond facial re recognition, right? Okay, the, no, not even, I mean, there's different kind of things. It's like, I know you're, I can tell that you're five foot tall, your shoulders are this length, and, you know, a number of different things, that, that how advanced the, the technology is so to, to get to the point where you, you can't hide in the way that you think that you can hide. But I think too much, some aspects of a, of a certain type of branding makes it easier for you to be identified, and that is where some of my weariness comes from, right? that I, I think that some things need to be very public and structured as a force of resistance, and some things need to be very anonymous. And I think we need to know when, when, when is which and what is what, and, and not mix the two, <coughs> quite honestly. So there was a couple of hands that, I, that, that there was three, there was one, two, there was one, I'm sorry, but anyway, go. Okay. Um, so you made a comment that I really agree with, which is that the left is limited by its imagination or the lack of imagination, and we need to grow that. And I want to explain why I agree with that and ask a question as well. The question is about March 8th, which is International Women's Day, and the call for a general strike of women and their allies on that day, and I wanted to get your mm -hmm. sense of what you think of it. Um, as people know <coughs> that um, there are women's groups in 30 countries around the world that have called for a day of action on March 8th. And um, Angela Davis and Priyanka um, <coughs> Yamhata Taylor, Nancy Frazier, and a bunch of socialist feminists put out a call a couple of weeks ago um, honoring this day of action and saying that we should have a general strike in the United States. And when I read that, I was like, oh my god, this is impossible. It's great, but I don't think we can pull this off. And in that sense, I was limited to <coughs> Uh, imagination of what is possible, right? I mean, this is what they said about 1908, the women who actually struck uh, and for whom international workers in New York, 
and for whom International Workers Day has been named and so on and so forth, they said women are, can never be organized. Women laborers can never be organized in the US, but they struck, they won, and so on and so forth. So in my union, my experience is that I have been able to take up this call. I'm the vice president of my union. Uh, I'm in the faculty union at Rutgers. I took this up and said, we can't strike right now. But we should have a vision, a long-term vision, of what it's going to take to actually have gender equality and gender justice and racial justice. And honestly, I've been fighting this for the last 10 years in my union, right? But the way I see it is that Trump represents both a curse, for all the reasons you mentioned, and a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. Because you're able to tap into people's anxieties at this moment, and they're open to hearing about all the things that you want to do, not just defensively, but offensively with a vision to actually bring about a different kind of you know, workplace and all the rest of it. So all that is to say, um, what do you think particularly about this call for a March 8th general strike? Um, the women's uh, March people, by the way, have endorsed it. And what I thought was impossible has now become quite possible. Because Elle magazine, not exactly your bastion of radical thought, had an article quoting Frederick Engels and Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> so obviously the impossible is possible today. So that's my first question. My second is, now in my own work, I found that working with the Democratic Party has been a dead end. Um, and you know, trying to reform this party and all the rest of it is quite honestly, in my opinion, a waste of time. So I wonder what you think about that and what you think of, about the Our, Our Revolution um, movement. Actually, I have a very similar view of a party in this country, a conservative uh, capitalist party, neoliberal ideology, all the way through it, versus the Democrats. And um, I was wondering, you're in, I, I agree that reforming the party seems like a waste of time, but I was wondering if it also needs to be a very weak institution. And I wonder, would be your take on So let me take these two questions that I saw other hands. There were one, two. Okay, I'm going to try to be quick, quicker because I, I, I know we've got like 10 minutes. So I'm going to be participating in March 8th. How many of how many y'all going to be participating? Is it a March or just an action? No, I'm saying March 8th. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be whatever we make it to be, whatever we, wherever we at. Um, yeah. But I mean, I'm I, I'm for call you know whatever we can pull together, whatever we can muster. Like I'm I'm going to support it as long as there ain't no reactionary BS. Um, whether I think it's it's uh, possible to become a, a a general strike, to me it's inconsequential on a certain level, and. I think we want to maximize and encourage people to participate <coughs> rather than say, you know, if everybody doesn't participate, it was unsuccessful. I don't think that that's helpful for us right now, right? As opposed to if you can engage, engage. If you can't engage, you know, that's, that's <coughs> cool too because there's other ways and there'll be other times in which we can, you know, fight back and going to have to fight back. One day in and of itself ain't going to do it. It ain't going to make it or break it. So. You know, I, I think whether people get in this debate, should we call it a general strike? Should, I mean, that, to me, that's irrelevant at this point, right? I think you, you just keep continuing to encourage folks to stay involved. And I think the, the question, however, is we can't keep mobilizing over and over and over. At some point, we got to start organizing, right? So that is that is my only criticism. I think at this like this first 100 days, it's going to be a whole bunch of mobilizing. But after that 100 days, if nobody sat down and start coming up with an organizing plan or what you do with all these hundreds of people that you done got all these lists for and all this other kind of stuff, then we are wasting our, our time and we're going to be summarily defeated, right? So at some point, some groups of us, either together or independently, however it, it needs to happen, there's probably going to be some combination of all that. We've got to start thinking about what's, what's the organizing plan and what's the organizing orientation. Otherwise, I think it's, 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 a, it's a loss, right? 
uh, and we got to have a long term vision. Now, this question of the Democratic Party, I it's a waste of time to to try to me, I think to try to take that that over. I don't think why in some ways it's you know we don't well that's not completely true anymore. You know we don't have. Uh, we don't have parties in the sense that, that you have parties in Europe. I think everybody would agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. But the the what there is and what there will be a tremendous hurdle overcoming is uh, the association with the Democrats with certain group interests, right? And that's a social question that has to be overcome. And, and so what do I mean by that? Um, like in, in Mississippi, the Democrats represent, that D represents black interests. Whether I like it or not, that is an objective reality that represents black interests and how people see and underst understand and relate to, to that. So I ignore that in my own peril. And I like coming up with some alternative to it, you know, has to be you know, very methodic and very deliberate and has to be an organizing strategy around that. Um, but trying to, um, you know, the, if trying to take that over in the Mississippi context, I still think would be empty because then you got to still challenge with the, with the National Party. And I can tell you from our experience just over the last six years, after Chokwe died, uh, Obama and particularly the Clintons started. They started spending uh, millions of dollars in Mississippi, uh, and they basically that they for the la most of the last fifty years, you know, they just kind of ignore uh, Mississippi because I know you know it's like for them I know basically that's a black party. They don't have nowhere else to go. I can count on them without doing anything, right? And that's typically the game we've been played. What we represented was a left challenge that had to be responded to, and that's where the money started pouring into or them trying to figure out how do we organize, how do we bring in new talent, how do we even bring in the left, some elements of the left in Mississippi into our fold, but not to advance a left agenda, to just to bring them into the fold. And so that's one of the key struggles that we're trying to get people in, in our circles to understand is, is it more important for us to advance our agenda or is it more important to keep certain relationships even though they don't necessarily benefit us? And there's a whole set of certain <coughs> questions that go with that about, well, how do you extract yourself? And I would say, you know, honestly, we, haven't, we, we are not on the same page. You know, uh, the Malcolm X grassroots movement and, and uh, New African people, we're not exactly on the same page uh, around it. I don't mind saying that in the public because I think, you know, uh, this is part of what we're struggling over to, to get this clarity. And it's not easy. It's not a cut and dry uh, answer. We're going to have to struggle through this, I think, very deeply and profoundly. Um, I think we've come up with some tactical mm -hmm. things some of which I'm not going, I'm, I can't share in public, but, you know, um, on how we are going to deal with this question uh, relative to uh, uh, Chokwe Antar's, you know, uh, 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 election and pending thing uh, that I think will possibly give some leverage. But it's not an easy question. But I think as many forces on the left are clear as a starting point, that the Democratic Party cannot be reformed, I think is the basis that I want us to start with. And I, then I think as many of us are clear that there is no other vehicle that exists that can serve the needs that we have, we also have to be clear on. So I don't think, even though I've supported the Green Party, I don't think the Green Party is that vehicle. I don't think the uh, 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 was it uh, our revolution? I don't think it's that vehicle. Uh, and I think something new is going to have to be constructed. And it would likely be 
50 different variants of something new as a start and then you know a struggle to kind of bring some things together so I don't in having a concrete answer I don't have one but I at least I think can pose that there's some, there's some starting ground that I would like us to have to just cut through some assumptions and say this is this is the floor from which we're operating from and then where do we go from here how do we you know build the ladder up we're going to have to figure that out together um, so I just have a question about tangible ways to like prevent organizer burnout because like I think I organize students, um, particularly undergrads, and people come with a lot of energy, lots of ideas, and then we face loss after loss after loss, especially in Wisconsin of late. Um, and like how do you directly and like tangibly keep people in it and not discouraged and burnt out and done? Because it's been a huge struggle for us. So do you have any kind of recommendation? Also like bringing new people in, like all this energy, like how do we bring them into like long-term organizing um, in like real ways? Student organizing is hard. So you, <laughs> yeah. got, a, you got a hard task. Uh, I found community organizing to be easier than, than student organizing just because of the, the natural rate of turnover. Um, you know, um, <coughs> it's been a long time since I was a student of anything, um, but you know, in my years, um, the first time I came to Madison, actually, I think it was 92, first and only other time I've ever been here. And that was to uh, organize, uh, or help organize like a national black pan-African student group. Uh, and it was a very weird exchange here, but um, but I, you know, it was we finally got to a place where, um, you know, we built up I think a good core on a national basis, and then everybody graduated, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> then you got to start all over, right? And then by that time, I was like, I'm I'm graduating too, and I, you know, I'm just. Uh, it's not my role to be organizing students, so you you, you have a hard challenge. But um, it needs to be done, um, and I'm saying that to to you specifically, you know, to help ground you in, in understanding the turnover, and that's just a natural part of the population that you you're dealing with. And I think for me, is it's kind of what what level of training can you provide? For folks to take, you know, that experience and encourage them to be organizers once they leave school, I think that is probably to me the 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 most long term thing that I think you can provide, which doesn't necessarily answer your questions around how to secure victories here, you know, which is immediate thing, but I think giving people the tools necessary to go to whatever profession or whatever community they're going to be in the long term is, is the major measure of success that I think that you would have as an organizer. Um, and here, you know, I don't know what necessarily what, what the, 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 the issues are here, but I think the, the, thing, uh, the thing that I found um, uh, most helpful in my student organizing days was making sure that there was a there was a solid mix of culture and uh, you know political activity, political action, and the two had to be mixed because that always had to be mixed or intertwined <coughs> because that was going to kind of keep people's spirits up regardless of whatever struggle that that, that we had, and sometimes people found it that you know I don't remember some of my comrades it was still the comrades. You know, they, they was like, you don't like poetry, so why do you support these poetry events? I said, it's not for me to like poetry. They like it. That's the point. You know, like, if it's going to encourage people to be engaged, it's not a matter of whether I like it. It's a matter of whether it's going to help us, you know, keep people on. And can we then turn it? Can y'all write some political poetry? Can y'all write other things in service of the struggle that we're doing? You know what I mean? But those were the things that I think I always found to be, you know, um, most helpful. And where I learned this from uh, was a battle with my mom about hip hop. I'm, I'm, I'm like the second generation of hip hop. And 
uh, I you know in the mid '80s, '84, '85, you know, arguing with my mom about hip hop was going to be the next revolution, and you know, this was going to be all this, and she was like, it's just music. It just, and I want you to understand. I was like, no, 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 this is it. This is going to be. We gonna do it. We gonna finish the work that y'all didn't finish, and blah, blah blah blah. She was like, "It's just music." And so, but there was a there was a bridge where she, in the long term, I remember. I think a couple of years ago, it was my 40th birthday. I wrote her a little uh, note because uh, what for for my birthday, I usually take my mom out for uh, you know for a dinner or something like that. Right? That's my me and her tradition. Uh, I'm like, you don't want you to be honored here. And she almost died giving birth to me, so there's a particular, you know, thing. And then, you know, we've had up and down relationships. We're real, real close now. But in that having those intense battles with her, and I mean, it used to be intense. You know, she didn't like it being played in her house. I had to keep the noise down. Um, uh, I used to, used to rap and stuff like that, and I would spend more time writing raps than I was doing my homework. So it was, you know, it was intense. And what I learned from that was that the culture was important because it kept me, the only thing that helped me to, 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 to the only reason I, I graduated high school, is I dropped out of middle school. I completely dropped out. Um, and the only thing that kept me in school was football uh, and writing corny ass rhymes. <laughs> right? That was the only two things. And making a deal with my mom that uh, if, if, if I was going to stay in her house, then I had to go to school. That was the, the deal. And so I made a deal that, well, if I'm gonna stay in your house, you gotta let me do my music thing, right? And so we, that was the compromise. So I knew what it meant to me to have that culture outlet. So I understood what it might mean for other people to also have that, even if I understood it or related to it or not, was not the point. You know, I understood, you know, she didn't like what I was doing, but she had enough respect to be like, if that's gonna keep you motivated, I'm willing to accommodate. Right, and, and to, to give it expression. And she always had her, you know, criticism. I'm like, you ain't going, you know, you're not going to be no millionaire. You're not going to do this. And, you know, I always ex uh, uh, <coughs> appreciate her brutal honesty, um, <laughs> um, which I learned later, you know, but she told me, you're not good enough to, <laughs> you know, to, to make it, you know. Um, and she didn't mean it in a bad way, but you know, later on it was like, yeah, okay, you're right. You know, like, I made a better choice going someplace else. But, um, but I think you got to find that integrated weave. You know, uh, you got to find that integrated weave and, and to keep that that balance. Um, but I, was, I still would emphasize, you know, try to develop people's skill for the long term. I think is the most important. <coughs> So I'm gonna go to some people who have How much longer do you want to go? I ain't gonna make about another ten minutes. Quickly on her question, wouldn't doing some of the things like the mutual aid network, uh, the boundary maker space, which is people oriented, and say these are the skills we're gonna need to organize wherever we live and to survive what's going on, and get people connected that way? Because marching is an adrenaline rush, but the marching and the organizing isn't gonna change the whole system, like you say. I think some of these things, like the time bank and other things, are are the tools that we're going to need for day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, but but I would imagine some of the, 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 the struggles that you need a concrete answer for are rising tuition, right, uh, and student debt. You know, so I think there's some very concrete things, at least that I understand, that students in this generation have to face that, you know, I'm still straddled with a bunch of student debt. And that was 25 years ago, so I know y'all, you know, facing levels of debt that, that I could probably only imagine uh, now. And there needs to be some concrete answers for that, right? I mean, that's part of it. And what I, I, I've been very, you know, the, the student movement, as I understand it, have been able to follow, and I don't follow as much as I, I used to. But I think there's been some major advances around the, the debt strike, right, uh, that need to be followed up on. And I think there needs to be a strategy of, A, how do you keep the students, you know, how do you, you turn more students on, you know, who are undergraduates in particular, onto that as soon as, they, as soon as they walk in the door, you know, they get their freshman orientation, it should be some of your organizers there saying, you know, you're going to have $100,000 debt by the time you, you, you finish out. And what's your plan to deal with that? Most people are not going to have a clue. 
But I think showing them and then saying, well, let's work on creating a movement that's going to deal with your personal situation and the situations of millions of people is a way to, to start. And then, like, how you walk them through four, five, six years, you know, of being engaged is one piece. But I don't think you're going to win that struggle without other folks involved outside of campus seeing it as a critical issue. And I think the movement has done a decent job of doing it, which is why I was on the Democratic platform and why Bernie picked it up and then Hillary gave it some lip service. But I still don't think that there's an organic enough mix with, say, folks who are facing medical debt, right? Like there needs to be an organic link about debt, period, that I think the students are still, I don't see a connection being made there around how do you sustain this movement to have a lasting impact beyond your student life, because it's going to have an impact <coughs> on you beyond your, your student life. Those other things, I think those are like build and fight for an alternative future. But I think the things that's going to turn these students on is I don't want to have, you know, uh, uh, $100,000 worth of debt, you know, hanging over me for the rest of my life. Um, you know, so I think those things. Just something that exists in that vision along with, like you said, that's their major thing. I think even the history that they don't understand that it used to be that the student paid 20% and the university did the 80 or the government, mm -hmm. or that it was almost free. I mean, they, they really don't have any idea that that's how it was. Well, I think that's, that's in part our job to, <coughs> to give people an orientation. But I think a larger part of the movement piece, which is not all necessarily students, we need to be coming up with a solid vision around how we're going to create free tuition from from you know free education from birth to death mm -hmm. you know because if I could afford it I'd be in school right now you know there's a whole bunch of shit I still want to learn you know and I'm not in my grave you know so you know uh, but I, I can't afford it right <coughs> and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people if they had the opportunity would want to learn a tremendous amount of things that people you know to fulfill our human potential we want to build a society where that can be realized right full human capacity and potential can be realized and I think that's something that, that, you know, getting people to understand how do you move from the immediate and concrete to your situation to the broader universal questions is something that we need the skilled organizers to do. But one doesn't negate the other. And often I would still want to say that I want to come at you with what's, what's going to open your mind first and then, you know, walk through how this is connected to other things. Just trying to unload you with how, you know, come join me in utopia. That typically don't work. You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. So uh, uh, we can't abandon, you know, what what turns people on and what they feel is is challenge, and start there and still meet people where they at, and then you know try to move them to other places. That can't be abandoned. I mean, that's basic organizing one on one. You know, it's, 